It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so we all agree that climate change is not fun. It's a bit like going to a fancy restaurant, you have some nice wine, nice food, and then bam, comes the bill. Nobody really likes to pay the bill. When I started working on climate change, and I, at the time I was still taking selfies, I was number one, I had like full of enthusiasm, I was young, uh, um, and then I experienced climate change, and uh, this is a picture of me in Congo, absolutely drenched after unusual rainfalls that actually took the lives of many in a, in a village of South Kivu due to an unprecedented landslide. Now, I started thinking really hard about it. It's like, how can we solve this problem? How not to get depressed about it as we tend to do with climate change? And for me, the key life-changing moment was in 2014, uh, and I was in Peru, and I met this man and woman that I captured on, on video. Okay, for, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, the last man say uh, it wouldn't be breakfast if there was no coffee. Actually, I think you would all be out of job if there was no coffee. I think we found out yesterday it was like 1.6 million of us in this country uh, that would be out of job. So climate change is a threat to your business, your business as usual. But it's only fair, if you think about it, business as usual has been and still is propagating climate change. So what I want to talk to you about today is unusual business. This is a, maybe the future of the shipping industry. This is a sustainable shipping from Fair Transport BV and Dijkstra Naval Architects. What I want to talk to you about today is how to shift from business as usual to unusual business. Unconventional, maybe undiscovered, and hopefully universal. From for the future, call this the big shift. First, you have to experience the need for change. We all agree coffee value chains are at risk of climate change, not in the future, now. So we need to diagnose the system, where lies the risks, and who is involved, and maybe where are the solutions. And then we need to pioneer some practices, be innovative. And basically, this is where we are now, I think, in the coffee industry. What we have yet to do is to enable the tipping point, sustain change, and mainstream it, which is the holy grail for me. So I want to tell you about our experience at Twin to work with UK and Peruvian partners. So I'm sorry, I'm going to take you back to Peru. And so we're going to go up the Altiplano at 4,500 meters, and then down again into the Amazon Basin to the region of Puno, which is close to the border of Bolivia, where lies the home of 900 coffee families, member of a cooperative called San Juan del Oro, which is a, a beautiful name. The weather system in that region is governed by the Andes, and the water is released by the ice caps, and unfortunately, this has changed rapidly the ice cap is melting due to rise in temperature. Rainfall patterns have also been erratic and have changed the way farmers, men and women, are growing coffee in that area. And also processing, drying has become more difficult. You, you don't expect rain when you want to dry coffee. This is a problem. We all talked about coffee leaf rust. I'm not going to go on about it, but this member of San Juan del Oro Cooperative actually lost 80% of his production in 2012, and he's only recovering now, this year, of the loss he's made in 2012. Broya in that area reached unprecedented altitudes, and that was a big problem for San Juan del Oro. San Juan del Oro supplies coffee to Twin Trading, our trading arm. We are an NGO, but we trade also green bean coffee that we sell to Matthew Algae. Matthew Algae is a family-run business from Scotland. Very nice people. And they roast and blend the coffee for one of the major UK retailer, Marks and Spencer, who serves this great specialty coffee in their stores. Both Matthew LG and Marks and Spencer realize, okay, we have a problem here. If we want to keep this supply chain, this value chain going, we need to think differently the way we do things. But let's hear it firsthand from Matthew Algae 
technical director Ewan Reed in that short video. On a, a wider scale, climate change is impacting our business now, we believe. Right now, it, it's, it's affecting purchasing decisions on, a, on an annual basis and sourcing plans into the long term. So it, it's here and it's, it's now. And we certainly believe that Roya is really the Canadian, the coal mine for climate change within the, within the coffee industry. Yeah, for, for those who struggle with Scottish accent like I do, uh, the last sentence is Roya, coffee leaf rust, is like the canary in the coal mine. In the coal mine, they used to take a canary in a cage, and when there was low oxygen, the canary will die first before people. So they will know there was a problem, do not go forward, there is no oxygen. So basically, coffee leaf rust has been, for Matthew Algae, a great indicator that there was a huge problem, and it was only one and the first symptom that we could see. So in 2012, we all started, Marks and Spencer, the retailer, Matthew Algae, the roaster, Twin, and San Juan de Loro Cooperative, man and woman producing coffee, we started by doing a climate risk assessment. What are the problems in that area? And try to identify the risks. What we find out is, of course, deforestation was a problem, we talked about it, and pest and disease, but mainly it was water management, access to and responsible use of water on farm for both growing coffee and coffee processing. And this was the starting point for us. We didn't try to solve all the problems at the, at the first time. We said, okay, well, let's focus on water. And this gave birth to the first, a very unique private partnership, a first in the UK, and certainly for us at Twin, is the first time we saw a project that was considering the whole value chain, and it was totally privately funded. No foundation, no public donors. And we decided to focus on water management, as I said, and use the Rainforest Alliance climate module, which showed at the time it was a complementary module to scale up. So we work on a, on a pilot project for two years, about $200,000 investment in this pilot, working with 150 farmers, not all the cooperative. We didn't try to solve the problem everywhere in every single zones of the cooperative. But this considerably strengthened this supply chain. And actually, I'm not gonna use the word supply chain, a human chain. This value chain, it was not just about coffee going from A to B, but it was more actually reinvesting from B to A, and also opening these communication channels between the retailer, the roaster, us, and the cooperative. This is a quote from Louise Nichols, and she's head of responsible sourcing at Plan A. And she says it is our collective responsibility to work together as supply chain partners to adapt to climate change. It's also good business sense for m and to invest in the very people we depend on to deliver the great quality coffee our customers expect. A collective responsibility. You may be familiar with this print who depicts the story of the blind monks and the elephant. It's a story that originated in the sub-Indian continent. The story says that the blind monks were asked to go and touch the animal and try to describe it. They all went individually, one went to the tail and thought it was a big broom, the other one went to the ear and thought it was a big leaf, the other one went to the, the mighty leg of the elephant and thought it was the trunk of a tree. And they all came back with very different opinion, very different idea of what the animal was. My point here is that we had to get together as value chain partners to describe the animal, describe the need for change. What we also learned at Twin is that to to trigger change and enable change and sustain it, we need to all have an interest in it. And we've, we've seen that there is an obvious interest for farmers. It might be their main or even only cash crop, their only livelihoods. For the coffee cooperative, the obvious interest is that they want to keep the economy, the rural fabric alive in the region and they want to keep supplying their clients with great quality coffee. But what is in it for m and and what is in it for Matthew Algae? Okay, for m and we've seen that it was their customer's interest at heart, but foremost, it's to be the leader in the industry. They have a sustainable strategy called Plan A. They call it Plan A because there is no Plan B. It's a bit like there is no Planet B. We have Planet Earth, but that's it. We don't have a second chance. They call it Plan B, and they have the vision to be the world's most sustainable retailer by 2020. 
And it's not just a corporate social responsibility document that sits on the shelf. It's deeply rooted in their supply chain management and climate change is at the heart of it. And what is in it for Matthew Algae? Well, as we've seen from you and Reed, they want to keep this unique origin, this great southern coffee coming from, from San Juan del Oro. They want to preserve that uniqueness. But they also are a very innovative family business. And they also have a sustainability strategy, but this strategy is aligned to m and And it's a collaboration between this sustainability strategy that has enabled us to see where the common interest were between these two actors. And they're also great people, as I said earlier. I love to work with them. They, um, they have coffee at heart and, and in mind, um, but also people. They love people that makes coffee. Let me bring you back to the present. After this two years pilot, we've decided to go even more unusual in Peru and brought a competitor of Matthew Algae, uh, Tailors of Harrogate. It's also a family-run business from north of England. And they supply Marks and Spencer retail part. And we decided that we should work together in a pre-competitive way. We said, OK, Peru is unique origin. Southern Peru is a unique origin. We need to work, even before we start talking about price and, and, and supply chains, we just need Peruvian coffee now and in the future, bottom line. They source from a different cooperative in central Peru called Pangoa. And I think we've said earlier that sustainability and change, well, basically, the needs for change have changed with time. So Pangoa is a different cooperative, and San Juan del Oro we only had a need assessment in 2012. So we had to reevaluate the need for change. And basically, we find out that it wasn't just water management, but we also had to work on gender justice, youth engagement, and sustainable culture. There is no one solution to climate change. We know that. We had to start somewhere. We started with water. Great. Two years after, we decided that we've kept hearing more and more that urban migration in South Peru was was a plague. People leave. We've heard about it. People leave. Young people leave to go to the gold mines. They go to Juliaca, the nearest city. Women are at the forefront of climate change. They do most of the work picking, harvesting, processing, yet very little of the proceeds come back to them. They are at the forefront of climate change, any change in productivity, in quality. And we've heard great things about um, climate smart agriculture from Aaron and Mark. And I, I'm a strongly believer in agroforestry and sustainable agriculture. As an agronomist myself, I have seen the effect that trees have on crops and on the soil system. You know, if the temperature rises by two degrees, it doesn't matter. Plant a tree. You can have four or five degrees shade under that tree. You just need to plant it now because, you know, time, trees take time to grow. So there's no one, one solution to climate change. OK, at this stage, you might think, how is in this business as usual? I mean, it looks like money in a charity pot and maybe a few visits in Origins. How is in this business as usual? Um, and actually, you're partly right. We haven't really invented unusual business yet. I was talking to a friend of mine in a cafe in East London the other day, and he works for Amnesty International. It was a vegan cafe in East London, and the rest of the story is not about saving the world with broccoli and permaculture. But to create empathy for the Syrian crisis, they use immersive experience. It's a type of sensory experience where they have filmed Syrian towns with 360 cameras, filmed, taken sounds, and proposed to citizens like us to be for one day completely immersed into the life of Syrians and to understand and have empathy for what it is to live in these countries. My point here is that there is still a great disconnection between consumers and producers. What is climate change for coffee drinkers? What, what is, do they think about farmers and climate change when they buy their coffee? Probably not. Although we've seen that there's a great appetite, especially amongst millennials, uh, to learn about sustainability and to engage and have more information. They don't want coffee, just coffee. They want coffee with a story. We learned that today, yesterday, actually. So my point here is, how can we see the value chain a little bit differently in an unusual way? Well, actually, 
producers and consumers get together and can reconnect. But somebody somewhere must have invented this already and actually exists already. It's called community-supported agriculture. If you're not familiar with the concept, it's basically a bunch of consumers investing and participating in the production of agriculture goods. It's a way of reconnecting with the land. It's a way of reconnecting with how is it to grow potatoes or carrots or tomatoes according to seasons, to feel that vulnerability and share the risks and benefits. But the other great thing about community-supported agriculture is that it brought back quality at the center of the debate. It brought back traceability and trust, yes, but it brought back quality at the center of the debate and what it is to taste real products. If you go to a UK or US supermarket and you think that the hydroponic tomato is the real taste of a tomato, it's not. It's not really the real taste of tomato and the same applies for coffee. If we, specialty coffee businesses, can show the real taste of coffee, then we can drive change through quality and bring back that discussion between consumers and producers. My point here is that if not us, who is going to make it? If not specialty coffee businesses who have this culture of traceability and quality at the heart of your business, who is going to do it in the coffee industry at large? And I'm asking you if you can be that tipping point. I'm asking you if that together we can invent and reinvent business so that we can mainstream it to the coffee industry at large. Can we invent a business where the cost of production are fully covered? We've seen that consumers are ready to pay 50 cents more per cup of coffee. That's a great source of, of money to channel through the, the value chain. We've seen that they want to hashtag something. You know, hashtag be part of the story. You know, be part of creating coffee. Can we invent business where quality is not just an expectation but a shared journey? It's not just an expectation from the consumers but actually something that we all share, retailer, roasters, producers, and we all try to improve so that we drive price upward so that farmers have the capacity, the financial capacity to reinvest in climate change. So it sounds all a bit daunting, climate change and how to, how to start, we feel sometimes isolated in a myriad of actors, but initiatives exist and tools exist. I've presented some of them today. And what I would recommend is basically try to reconnect. Describe the animal, don't do it alone. Do it with your value chain partners. You know your value chains. Most of you do direct trade or have some sort of traceability. Reconnect the dots between the partners, describe the animal and find the common interest and start to tackle one problem, maybe water, maybe gender justice, start somewhere. You have to start somewhere, but we have to start now and reconnect. Thank you.